eight o'clock welcome to tribe tv so good that you're here today please do share the link make sure you're subscribed to the channel press the notifications so that you can know any time that i'm coming on to do some stuff we've got some songs coming up tonight we've got a new style program i'll give you a little bit of a clip of a new style program that we're about to launch in November it's gonna be fun no it's not gonna be talking heads like this it's gonna be kind of interesting fun gonna take you on some adventures and then really the the main part of tonight is uh, we had a prophets speak evening with Simon Breaker the other night and I don't know we had somewhere like 1995 people on a zoom and Simon was just sharing with us what he thinks God is saying right now. And I want to share with you the highlights of that tonight. So it's a prophet speak night. What is God saying right now to us, the church? What is he doing? Where is he leading us? What are the dangers to look out for? How can we cooperate with what God is doing right now? I don't know about you. I still need to keep hearing God in these unusual times. So it's a prophet speak night tonight. Um, well, this new star program we've got coming up is going to be a little bit of fun. Can you believe it? We're going to take you to places like the French Alps, Cape Town, Singapore, Australia. We're going to paddleboard the best beach in the world. Here's a little clip of something coming up later this year. What do you think to that? That's going to be a bit different, right? We're going to take you on some little adventures and we are looking for God in beautiful places, hearing his voice through amazing adventures. We want to have some fun. So we'll carry on with these Tribe TV talking head programs, you know, look at prophecy, do interviews, stuff like that. But we also want to have a little bit of fun. I really sense that one of the things that we're coming into in God is a sense of playfulness and beauty and adventure and exploring. I don't know about you, sometimes church life can be a little bit one-dimensional, but God wants us to get out and to see the world and to preach the gospel to the world and to be getting out and playing childlike uh, in his presence. That's the way he wants us to live. So we're going to go and have some adventures and see what we can learn from God as we go. I hope you enjoy it. Um, so tonight, I'm going to, in a moment, uh, play you uh, uh, Simon Breaker talking about what it feels God is saying uh, right now. Now, the people in this Zoom were in the main people from the tribe, which is our global online learning community. And uh, that's been growing wonderfully under lockdown. Hundreds of people around the world growing in leadership, growing in worship, growing in the prophetic, growing together. These are the days to really embrace and use technology to the max. So we have members all over the world uh, who have access to a, a tribe learning zone with over 700 modules of teaching on all kinds of things. Um, but also, yeah, we do Zooms, we hang out, people get books, and it's just a learning 
community growing in God together. Now, at the moment, there's 20% off uh, membership of the tribe for tiers one or two. So head to jarrocooper.net and have a little look at that. The link will be down in the description with this program. 20% off right now. The other thing that's really interesting is we've just launched our first certified leadership course. In fact, it's a certified spirit-filled leadership course. And I take you through all the foundations of spirit-filled leadership. I'll stretch you into the concepts of the prophetic, the prophetic and revival, but also really basic stuff too, but important stuff to really get it working. How to grow church in a modern West environment and stuff like that. Uh, so if you join the tribe, uh, tiers two or three, that is available to you right now, the certified spirit-filled leadership course. Have a little look. Um, so uh, if you want to join us in the Zoom that you will see in a moment to come and join the tribe and you get to hang out uh, a good few times a year on Zoom. Uh, we tend to do a lot of prophetic stuff on Zoom and interview prophetic people, which is really quite interesting and stimulating in this time. Um, while people are gathering, why don't I play one song and then we will dive straight into, from the end of the song, we'll dive straight into being on Zoom with Simon. This one is like a highlight version, so it's, there's plenty in it. You'll get the absolute uh, uh, main content of everything that Simon said. But if you want the full uncut one, that again is in the tribe zone. So come and join the tribe if you want to watch the full hour of content. Okay, let's have a song and then let's get to Simon on Zoom. Above all powers, above all kings. Above all nature and all created things Above all wisdom and all the ways of man You were here before the world began Above all kingdoms, above all thrones Above all wonders the world has ever known Above all wealth and the treasures of the earth There's no way to measure what you were Crucified, laid behind the stone Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all Above all thrones, above all wonders that this world has ever known, above all wealth and the treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what it
you know 20 months we we've, we've tracked quite similarly prophetically and i think before we start talking about uh what's god saying from here onwards and into 2022 could you give us a bit of a potted sense of what you have sensed from god um during the pandemic maybe even leading up to if you want to but but what's been your prophetic journey what have you felt god has been doing and saying in this time so i think the first thing to say is um I was actually in the February, just before we went into lockdown, I had the pleasure of being with my dear friend, Emma Stark up in Glasgow. And I'd spoke at the conference and on the Sunday, I'd been praying for the conference uh, for, the, for the Sunday service. And as I was praying for the service, the Lord said to me, if I take away your conferences and your church meetings, will you still be burning for me? Hmm. And I thought that was a rhetorical question. And I said it in the meeting, and I think probably um, the Lord was actually poking at something, saying, you are going to come into a season where things are going to be shook up. I'd been been meditating on um, Psalm 23, but looking at it maybe from a different perspective to what I had previously. Because, you know, when, when the sh season shifts, scriptures that we're familiar with need to be led in, read in light of the season you've entered. Very good. And, and as I was reading that, that psalm, you know, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. And, and the thing that was really resonating to me was the Lord and the Lordship of Jesus and that dynamic. And then it, it, it goes a little bit later. It talks about the green pastures. And I've had a Hebrew scholar check this for me. So I know this is accurate because I went in the lexicon and thought, well, isn't that interesting that green pastures actually means threshing floor or one of the meanings it means the right. threshing floor or a place to be pressed yeah and um and i think when we think of green pastures and restoration i think probably we sometimes think of i'm laying on the grass and resting in the sun and enjoying luck but actually god's restoration sometimes looks a little bit different to that yeah. and it, it involves pressure and it involves shaking so that was what I came into the into the pandemic with. The other thing I came into the pandemic with was a sense that it was a three year process that we were in, um, which I've got to be honest, I, I'd forgotten about that. Actually, I would totally forgotten the Lord had said that to me. And then I happened to be in Portsmouth with Rachel Hickson, who probably many of you know. And she said, of course, we heard that this was a three year process. And I, I, I'd quite like to forget that because I'd rather not have another year. You know, I'd rather we just can just now just go, woohoo, that's over with. But yeah, I yeah. do have this sense, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, about the um, about the fact that we actually now have another year of stuff. I mean, we're always going to have stuff, but God moves in cycles and moves in seasons, and we want to yeah. cooperate with that. I think the reason why that's important is because you um, you pitch yourself differently for a sprint to when you're in a marathon. Very good. And if you know you're in a marathon, I mean, leading, when you're leading a church, we, we lead those moments, don't we? We have sudden explosions where we want to bring breakthrough and they're great, but you can't lead church like that all the time. Otherwise everybody's exhausted. Um, and I think the thing of it is in this is, is that what God's really been talking to me about is he wants us to have sustained momentum rather than little bursts. Um, but over the lockdown period, one of the things I really felt myself, and I think, Jared, we talked about this, is, Lord, you've not sent the pandemic. We know that. And we absolutely know you don't want people sick. We also know that even people who didn't pray are praying now. <laughs> so there's no deficit of prayer. It's not like there's not 
pre- there's not something in the spiritual atmosphere to facilitate for things to shift. And I absolutely believe when we pray, God responds. I just think sometimes, or most of the time, if we're honest, he doesn't respond the way we would like him to. Yeah. And and my, set, my, my, my sense in it was, is Lord, I want to learn, I want to catch, I want to understand what you want me to catch from this season. And if I'm honest, I think there's been some stuff that's been missed. And I think one of the things that the Lord was poking at and continues to is is consumer-driven, franchised Christianity that is that is mobilized, well, not even mobilized, it's led from platform, focused on platform, and measures its success on the basis of platform. Wow. And I, and I think the Lord really address, used the pandemic, if I can put it that way, to address that. But I think the travesty is, is in some settings at least, rather than the platform being being shut down, it simply moved to a different place. And, and it all became, I had some conversations where it all became who can put on the best online performance. And, yeah. and that's just the same thing being done in a different place and now we find ourselves in the challenge and i hope this is okay to say but i've started the sentence now so (laughs) i will finish it um what some people are not coming back to church yeah and and some of those people are not going coming back to church because they're passive because they've been lazy because they've got comfortable and they're not re-engaging with life but then there's another group and the reason why they're not coming, there's probably more than two groups, but I want to talk about this other group. And this other group, the reason why they're not coming back to church is because the culture of church has been, in many, in some settings at least, a, a spectator's exercise. And their presence or their absence has made no real change to what takes place in the room. And therefore, for some, it's like, well, if I'm just going to spectate, I'd rather do it in my pajamas at home. Wow. And I think we need to ask some really difficult questions or answer them. Are we actually an equipping, mobilizing church or are we uh, uh, an entertainment driven church, which is a challenge. And of course, it's not that God doesn't want us to be entertained because he absolutely does. I believe there's there's aspects of God's nature that he delights. I mean, why did he make a sunset the way he did? Because he wanted us to enjoy it. He wants us to enjoy creation. So I don't think we need to throw everything out. But I do think there's an element that's been missing and the element of we want you to be equipped. So I'll finish with this and you jump in, Jared. Uh, I, I was I was walking the other day with a dog. And uh, I, I said to the Holy Spirit, I said, what do you want to show me, Holy Spirit? And I had a picture, I had a vision of, of a really neglected dog. And it was chained, it was malnourished, and it was neglected. And I said, Lord, why, why are you showing me that? And he says, well, that's me. I said, I beg your pardon, what do you mean by that? He says, well, that's how much of the church treats me. I'm chained. And I'm only interacted with when it's convenient. And I'm given limited freedom and limited attention. And then as I was walking along, he started using statements, which I've used myself. And he, and he said, what about this? We'll have the worship. Then we'll have the preach. And then we'll make some space for the Holy Spirit to move. And he just said, it's very big of you to allow me some space. And it's also interesting to me that there's no need for me to move in the worship and no need for me to move in the preach. And he just started to just poke at some language. And we know what we mean by this stuff. I mean, I'm not coming down on things, but I just felt the Lord challenging our attitude and our mindset towards how he leads the church and, and how we interact with him. And as I was going down to Portsmouth to a leaders gathering down in Portsmouth, before I got there, I had a series of four different dreams and I saw a bus and I was involved with this bus. And the first first dream, I couldn't catch the bus and I missed the bus and it got away. I lost it, basically. The, The second dream, 
the bus crashed. The third dream, I couldn't find the bus. So the first one I lost, uh, I, I missed it. The second one, it was crashed. The, the third one, I lost it. And then the last one, it got exactly where it was meant to go. And in the midst of it, I heard the Lord laughing. And I said in the dream, I said, Lord, what are you laughing at? He says, were you under the illusion that you were the one driving the bus? And just this sense of God wanting us to change perspective, that we're not the one that's directing the bus, driving the bus. He is. Yeah. And, and coming to that place of dependency on him. So I've talked a long time. I'm going to let you jump in, Jared. Otherwise, I'll talk for ages. No, uh, it's just in, in, in incredible. And and um, just to remember back to some of those things, I remember you, I'm, I'm, I'm jotting on notes. That's why I'm looking to one side because I'm, I'm taking notes on what you're saying here. We're, we're jumping back to the beginning, the green pastures being the threshing floor. Some of yep. it's come up in our, we're, we're nearing the end of 21 days of, of prayer in the church. And uh, one of the recurring themes, because, you know, the end game is the glory of the Lord's going to, Cover the earth as the waters yep. cover the sea, and you know what? 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 what where, where do you find glory? Well, in in a temple first, and and then we've kind of tracked it back. So, where was the temple? Well, it was built on the threshing floor of Aronai the Jebusite, and that uh, the, the foundation of the temple is a threshing floor. So, purity, cleansing, uh, yep. a separation of good and bad. Even even every. Everything you've just said, it's the separation from, are we really neglecting the Lordship of the Holy Spirit? Uh, you know, we like the goosebump of the Holy Spirit, but are we neglecting the Lordship of the Holy Spirit and God truly moving among us? So I think a threshing, a purifying is what's been going on. And I mean, let's just be honest, that's not pleasant. You know, the goosebumps tend to subside and the gritty stuff starts to come out. Um, and I think, I don't know about you, I feel like that is still going on right now, even as we let's turn yep. a corner and start to think, well, what's happening now and where are we, where are we heading? Maybe you might even, if you've got anything for 2022. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things I feel is going on right now is still a deeper level of purifying. How do you feel about that? Yeah. I mean, it, I think I don't know how God works with you, Jared, so far as um, as the prophetic is. For me, he gives me phrases and what he'll do is he'll give me a phrase. And it's not it's not rooted around a date or a year. Um, it's rooted around season. And um, I know there's some people say it's going to be on this particular month or that month. OK, if that works for you, that's fine for me. I can't generally we've got a, a prophetic retreat coming up in January and I know darn well I'm going to arrive there and I'm not going to have received the word yet that the Lord wants to say to me because it's just not the way it works for me but in this dynamic the beginning of this year he said to me two statements for the beginning of this year was the year of the crucible and the year of the furnace and and he he used those terms in two ways that you know the crucible is is when you heat up the metal and you get the impurities out of the metal and it's and it's scraped off and you end up with that pure gold or you know the testing of your faith and all of that dynamic and that's what you're talking about there jared with as yield into the lordship of god and he he actually said to me every new season has a new sound and the sound of this season is the one of yieldedness wow and he says the sound of this season is yieldedness and that can look in many different. I mean, you can lay on the floor and weep and be totally not in yieldedness at all. You can be in, I'm trying to manipulate you, Lord, with deep emotion. What we're talking about or shouting, what we're talking about is the surrendering of the heart is what we're talking about. Um, the other aspect, the, the, the furnace, we know about the, the free young man, your shack, my shack and the bungalow, as I call them, because <laughs> I just keep on forgetting their names. Don't you wish their names were Tom, Dick and Harry, but they're not. Um, but what happens? They're faced with a decision. They are either going to compromise their values or they're going to make a stand. And making a stand was costly. Making a stand was was something that actually put their life on the line. And, and I've had this sense that this is something that is going to become increasingly something that we're going to experience. I mean, it always tickles me when we hear somebody in the Western world saying, the church is being persecuted. Well, go to Nigeria and Ukraine and India and Brazil. And, and, and that, that we have, we've been tickled. We've not been persecuted, really. Um, not that we want it. 
But the reality of it is, if we are going to begin to decree, declare the real gospel and the fullness of the gospel, then we're going to also attract those that are offended by it. And I think we're going to find ourselves in that place where we're going to have the, the crucible, where the Lord deals with our hearts, and then we're going to have the furnace where we have to make a stand. But of course, making that stand cannot come from a self-righteous heart. It's got to come from a surrendered heart. Otherwise, it just comes with a wrong spirit. It's not a pointing finger, but it's seeking to reflect something of a different nature. And uh, I believe that's something that we are still in the process of. And then there's what we're going to come at, what I believe has already started as we're moving forward. <clears throat> yeah. And, oh, boy. And so into 2022, have you got any sense because you talk about a three-year process um do you have any words or sense of that third year i know for instance rachel hickson <laughs> she, I, I think i can't remember who i heard first but it was within about 10 days of each other and i don't think you'd seen each other at the time um but rachel said three-year process and then you said three-year process or the other way around and rachel talked about Year one, it, it would be like this. I can't remember. And year two was like a contending type year, year. And year three was the year you get the keys, I seem to remember her saying and things like that. Um, the third year of the process, as we come into it, have you got any senses about what that might be like, where we are going to? It's, it's amazing. At the beginning of January, sorry, in January 2020, so before any lockdown, we had Sharon Stone with us. And she prophesied then 2020 will be about the new normal, which nobody had used that phrase up till then. But God had been doing something in 2019 with her, hadn't he? And, mm -hmm. and then God had said, yep, yeah, and it's going to be the new normal again. And in fact, she'd use language I use about it's the beginning of a new era. But she added in January 2020, but there will be a pause first, mm -hmm. um, which has turned out to be absolutely remarkable. But then charting forward, what is the new normal? What is the year three? Have you got any guidance or even warnings about uh, things we shouldn't be doing or that might get in the way of where God wants to take us in year three? So, yeah. So I, I asked the Lord about it and, and, he, and he said, I said to him, what's your word over this next phase, if you like? And he said, this will be the phase of the big squeeze. And I thought, Okay, can you give me something else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can it can it be the phase of the big beach? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or the long holiday. Yeah. Um, but it but that was what what he said to me, and um and I and what I find is he gives me an anchor point for me to pray from, and then he begins to sort of outline it and and um, and begin to expand it, and I believe there's two aspects to it to the big squeeze. Um, I'm going to read two scriptures to you that I think really highlight it well. The first one is in Proverbs and it's um, <clears throat> Proverbs 11, one, and I'm re I'm reading it in the, in the passion translation. The, the other translations say something along the lines of the Lord detests uneven scales or words that are effect. The passion translation says this, to set high standards for someone else and then live up, then not live up to them yourself is something that God truly hates. But it pleases him when we apply right standards and measurements. When you act with presumption, convinced that you're right, don't be surprised if you fall flat on your face. But walking in humility helps you make wise decisions. Integrity will lead you to success and happiness, but treachery will destroy your dreams. When judgment day comes, all wealth of the world won't help you one bit. So you'd better be rich in righteousness, for that's the only thing that can save you from death. Wow. And there's, I mean, there's an hour in this, really. And I just want to land on just really verse three, where it says integrity will lead you to success. Integrity wow will lead you to success. And then, of course, right at the beginning of the verse, it talks about this business that to set right standards and to not have uneven scales. And the sense that I had I actually released the word, if you want the fullness of the word, 
It's on my um, on my Facebook profile. I could probably send it to you, Jared, if you like. Yeah, um, yeah. The the essence of it was this: that the a part of the squeezing is God dealing with hypocrisy in the church, and God dealing with compromise in the church god dealing with facade and performance and the lack of integrity and it's not just going to be in the church but it's going to be in the nation as well and that's there's going to be things that are going to happen that there's going to be a squeezing process that's going to begin to take place that is going to bring things to the surface in our nation and in our lives that quite frankly are not pleasant to see now the Lord gave me this word about a week before we had the facade of the fuel crisis. Mm. And, and I don't know what happened in your part of the country, but the way that people behaved, some <laughs> of the things that we saw happening in Leicester was beyond selfish, beyond hostile, beyond uh, unrighteous. I mean, one lady put in fuel in a carrier bag to put in the back of the car, which is always going to be an idea when petrol is a solvent, it'll just dissolve the bag. But you just had this entire dynamic of it's me centered. It's all about me and about my, my, my needs and my focus. And I heard, I think it might've been Rick Joyner that made the comment that he said, what the ills that are in the nation many times were in the church first. Wow. And, and this dynamic of please me, serve me, love me, look after me. And it's me to upon the start, me to the beginning. And the Lord began to talk to me about worship and, and about the focus of worship. And uh, this is a teaching in and of itself. But Judges chapter three, that f- love it, my boy's favorite story from very little about the fat guy that gets stabbed with the sword. Um, that guy there, Iglon. If you look at the meaning of his word of his name, it means golden calf. It's the same word that is used when it says that the Israelites formed the golden calf. And Iglon was governing over Israel, and Israel, the Jews, were sacrificing to Iglon. And and the Lord said this to me: said that which you sacrifice to is what you will be governed by, and what you will be ruled by. Yeah. And I'm convinced that some of what is called worship is worship, but it's worship of me. And it's very much focused on me, how I feel, what I want, do I feel good? And it's produced, I want to say within prophecy, it's produced consumer focused prophecy. It's produced consumer focused church and it's produced consumer focused ministry. I had a a high point in my ministry recently that I got heckled. And the reason why I got heckled is because in the preach, I said this, I said, God does not have a purpose for your life. And then I just let it hang there for a while. I said, what God has is a purpose and your life is included in it. So we find our purpose by surrendering our self-life and engaging with God's plan. But the driving force behind much is how can you prosper? How can you do better? How can you succeed? How can your life be better? And these things are balances that the Lord is going to deal with, and he's already beginning to do it. He's beginning to squeeze and beginning to cause us to face some stuff that we just don't want to see, really. And I, I... And some, I would say some, there's been some drive. We want to get the people back in church because we need to build, we need to pay for the building. (laughs) Yeah. Which is a little bit concerning. And it's like the, 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 the structures have become the focus. And the Lord said this as I was meditating over this word. He said, many of my people and many of my leaders have become wineskin infatuated to the point that they're almost oblivious of the wine. Wow. And if the white, and he then showed me a picture of a heart and there was no blood. And he said, if there's no blood, the heart is purposeless. And we, we particularly the Western church, you can sometimes get the impression and I'll get on to the, the other part of this is, is um, if we can just get the right wine skin, then it's all going to work. And actually it isn't that way round, is it? It's it's actually if we can come to the place that we're fully yielded to the presence of God 
and dependent on the presence of God. The wineskin is almost incidental. It's not that we don't need structures. We do. But the structures are not put in place to produce the wine. The structures are put in place to manage what God is doing, not to produce what God is doing, because what God does, God does. Yeah. And that, I think the last bit, just to, if you was to say to me, what phrase personifies this side of the squeezing, the pressing, the, the phrase is this, that Jesus said, I only do what I see the father doing of myself. I can do nothing. That dynamic that I only do what I see the father doing. And I believe this squeeze is God saying, I am going to bring you to the place that there's less activity and more focus on me because we've almost idolized activity and, and removed him from the position of centrality. So that's the first half. Do you want to comment on any of that, Joe, before I talk about it? Well, um, hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I, I, well, I always can. I told you I try not <laughs> to talk to it. Can we hear, hear to have you talk? But, but I did just the other Sunday, you know, I felt, because I'm interested in, so, you know, what do we do? I know, God, there is a squeeze. There's a cleansing. There's a threshing. There's a purifying um, people are feeling it in their emotions or lack of um, uh, the fact that not everything about church is going to be a joy. When you're going through cleansing, you, you often it's like the, the presence can lift sometimes entirely. The sense of the presence can lift for long periods and you're, you're left with with um, you and your thoughts and your integrity just to sit there in the grit and see what's really inside you. But people need to realize that is a work of God when that happens. Absolutely. Um, the other thing I'd say, and I, and, and, uh, I think it connects in, but uh, just uh, a, week, a week last Sunday, uh, you know, we, we're just slowly beginning to get public services back with hiring and renting. And, and you know, we, we're get, getting, getting the music going, getting the preachers going, but... Uh, just, I don't know, 10 days ago, it would have been, I just, I was so frustrated with already the patterns that were forming, uh, the liturgy, even in the, the Pentecostal liturgy that was forming. And I woke up on that Sunday morning. And as I awoke, I just saw uh, the lectern fall to the ground, you know, like a, like a vision or a picture. And um, it, it toppled and I just knew, well, I got up on that Sunday morning and I reenacted what I saw. I, everyone that was there will remember the lectern just about survived. I toppled it to the <laughs> ground and I just spoke about, I, I stepped away from my notes. I stepped away from my planned PowerPoint. I think we were about one and a half songs into the service. And I just thought, uh, I, I, I can't take it anymore. God wants to do something. And I spoke about repentance and I stepped off the platform and walked among the people for the first time in 20 months, probably, and laid hands on a few people. What, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, if we come back and just replace everything as it was or even similar and don't just pause and say, God, where are you? Where is the God of Elijah? Will you come? Well, for 45 minutes, we didn't sing a song. People wept. We cried. The, the lectern was toppled over. I just knelt on the platform and cried myself. And I think what we need right now, Simon, is not clever preachers. Um, it is crying preachers. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, how do we do what you're saying? Well, number one, most of the time we're going to feel pretty rotten under the heavy hand of God, but we need to humble ourselves under his hand that in due time, there's always a time, isn't it? He will lift us up. But then the second thing, make space for the repentance to flow publicly. Yeah, absolutely. I'll stop uh, there. You take us on. Absolutely. I mean, before I move into the into the other half of the of the squeezing the uh, to to sort of tie off that last part, I believe Isaiah six personifies it well. That Isaiah comes to the realization of his need to repent off the back of a fresh revelation of the glory of God. Yeah. That, that you know, it's that that Isaiah six text is the place where the, the the rabbis get the name of God, God, the ever arriving one, because the text when it says 
the train of his robe filled the temple, the, the tense is the train of the robe filled and kept on filling the temple. And this, this dynamic of, of God arriving and the, and the revelation of the beauty, the majesty and the glory of God brought Isaiah to the place. I can say nothing. I'm a man of unclean lips. And, and for me, the, the, the clearest sign that the Holy Spirit is moving close to his church, or is let's put it this way, I don't believe the Holy Spirit actually moves. I believe we move. I find myself these days questioning whether there's a move of God or whether there's a move of people to God, because Lord's the same always. And I just find myself thinking, Lord, have you stopped moving or have we stopped moving with you? But that's another conversation. But as, as you move closer to him, the evidence that you're moving closer to him is repentance. Yeah. And the thing that then comes off the back of repentance is a renewed conviction to service. Wow. So what happens? There's a revelation. I saw the Lord, not I saw my savior. And the Lord said this to me, says the reason why much of the church is not mobilized is because you've preached a savior and not a Lord. Wow. And we have a, we have a gospel of salvation but it's not married with the Lordship of Jesus. And of course, salvation saves you from something, but the Lordship of Jesus engages you to something. Very good. And this, this dynamic that, that Isaiah has a revelation of the Lord. He then repents. And then what happens? Who shall we send? And Isaiah's response is here. I am send me. So the, the we, I think we, we resort, <laughs> we resort to, um, programs and methods when the lordship of jesus is absent when there's a when there's a lack of revelation of the lordship of jesus then you have to resort to tools and methods to try and get people to do what they do by default when they meet with christ exalted think about paul what do you want me to do lord who are you lord immediately there was a surrendering of heart and i believe this is so important that there, we are as a nation in one of the most exciting moments the church has been in for a long time. Yeah. We're in that place that, 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 that many leaders are on their knees. Many leaders are in the place that they're saying what, what we've done has not worked and we want to come to a place of fresh concentrate consecration and surrender. Um, so that's that the other half, this is comical. Um, We've got, a, we'll talk about it later, but we've got a conference coming up in November and uh, it's a prophetic conference. And I joked with a number of my, um, my prophet friends who are going to be speaking. And I said to them, I want you to know that there is a trap door that's been fitted to the stage. And if you turn to Isaiah 42, verse nine, <laughs> the floor will open and you will disappear. And if you don't know what Isaiah 42 verse nine says, it says this, see the former things have taken place. I'm announcing new things before they spring into being. I'm telling you them about telling you about them. And honestly, if I had a pound for every time I've heard that verse, I genuinely will be able to buy you a new building, Jared. I I mean, it, it's just, it, it, it has been preached to death. And, and the thing of it is, is, is that, the new thing has been talked about, but it's been given no definition whatsoever. And it's been many times, I may have said this on the broadcast when I was with you last, um, many times what's defined as the new thing is the old thing done with more enthusiasm. <laughs> and it, it kind of lasts for a while, but doesn't actually produce anything. And, and then after I said, we're not going to use this, but the Lord said, I want you to read it, Simon. So that's his sense of humor. And, <laughs> um, and I went back to, he says, I want you to read the verses that aren't read. So I read the verses around it. And I reckon that probably 90% of people, if you say, how many of you know, see the former things have taken place. I'm announcing new things to you before they spring into being, they will appear. I think pretty much everybody can quote that. But what about the verse previous? And most people, I think, don't know the verse previous. And the verse previous says this, I am the Lord. I am one. I won't give my name and glory to another, nor my praise to idols. Yeah. So we want the new thing. Well, the new thing 
is preceded by a repentance and a focus that says all the glory belongs to you. Very good. And if we are under the illusion that we are going to be able to say, well, of course, the reason why we've got revival is because of the song. Or it's because of our seven step method. Or it's because of our fasting. Or it's because of our prayer. It's all because of him. It starts with him and ends with him. And the thing that births the new thing is a dead thing. And the dead thing is us. That we die to self. And he says, I will not give my glory to another. So then that means we need to lose ourselves because John 17, Jesus said, I've given them the glory that you gave me. Yeah. So if that's the case, if he's going to give us his glory, but then said, I won't give my glory to another. The only way that we could receive his glory is if we come vitally united with him to the point that we lose all self and all that is left is him. And I believe that this 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 dynamic that God is wanting to birth, this squeeze that God is wanting to do is he's wanting us to surrender and die. And I, I was talking to somebody recently. I mean, this is the foundation of the Christian faith. It's not a new revelation. Death has always been the point of birth. It's never changed. It started with Jesus, that it says he's the first fruits of those who were resurrected. But for resurrection, there has to be a death. And I believe that is a dynamic that God is working in his church. And then we'll jump a few verses. Listen to what it says later. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise to the ends of the earth, his praise to the ends of the earth. And it's now focused entirely on him. You who sail down the sea and everything in it, let the desert cry out its towns and its villages. Let those who live sing for joy. Let them shout aloud to the mountaintops. Let them give glory to the Lord. And when this happens, when the people of God come to this place that Jesus takes center stage, that God takes center stage, then this takes place. The Lord marches out like a warrior. He stirs up his rage like a man of war. He makes his anger heard. He shouts aloud and declares the mastery over his enemies. Now, listen to this. I didn't know this was in this verse. It says, I've certainly stayed silent for a long time. I've kept still and held myself back. But now, like a woman giving birth, I cry out. I knew that verse, but I didn't know it was there. And I believe there is a birthing that God wants to bring forth. But the only way that birthing can take place is manifest through John 12. I tell you the truth. Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. And what's that whole for all of that? What's it surrounded by? It's surrounded by Jesus saying this, Father, glorify your name. How does the Father respond? I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. And how did the Father glorify it? By nailing Jesus to the cross. Well, actually, he didn't nail Jesus to the cross, did he? Jesus yielded to the nailing. That is the power of yeah. the cross. God didn't take Jesus and force him on there, but Jesus willingly surrendered. And that, to me, is the, is the beauty of the cross, that the temptation when he hung there and they said, get down, that temptation was a reality he could have done, but he stayed there. And this is our challenge that as God's people, we can do it in our own strength. And we have shown that with a few minor keys and smoke machines, we can manipulate people into the place that they think they're having an encounter with God. And I have no issue with minor keys and no issue with smoke machines, but I do have an issue with manipulating people to make them feel they've encountered God, but yeah. then they walk away no more transformed than they were by what, in fact, less transformed than they were when they walked into McDonald's because, well, no, we'll leave that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the other squeezing. And it's interesting. You read further. I don't want to read too much more, but it goes on where it says, I, I will bring down the idols and I will destroy the high places. And this to me begins in us. The level of authority we have externally is directly connected to the level of surrender we have internally. You cannot bring down idols that exist 
outside of you if they exist in your own heart. And, and there are things in our nation that exist because we've not conquered them in the church. Wow. Wow. Over to you, Jared. Yeah. Well, I'm just like, what do you, how do you follow this? I mean, this is, this is, this is the real thing. But when you were, when you're talking about lordship versus God being our savior, I mean, a conversation I've been having recently is, you know, as churches face things and we're facing things as a church, um, what's often asked of, of someone like me or it's suggested to me is we need to create a system to fix that problem. And my response has, has, has become, and I think it's because of what you're saying, uh, if the culture was right, you wouldn't need a system. The, the yeah. problem is there's no lordship and therefore you're trying to create a system to kind of hold the thing together because people aren't bond servants and slaves of Christ. I, I, I know the best people around me are not those that, are, that love Jared or want to serve Jared or like Revive Church. The most reliable people in my world are slaves of Jesus Christ who have been ordered to come help me. And that's, that's hugely different from preference, the kind of he's my savior, therefore everything is preference, therefore churches have to be filled with systems to make up for the lack of lordship in the culture. Yeah, there it is. If we come back to lordship, you can lose all the systems. I mean, how how do how did the early church grow so rapidly without any system or certainly very, very loose, relaxed ones? It's because the holiness of God that's birthed in a move of revival holds everything in check in a way that you don't find when there's only ankle deep water running around people's feet. Um, if we're going to step into glory, that, that verse, you know, I will not yield my glory to another. When I would um, teach on the glory of God, it was because, you know, it's evident from scripture that he will give his glory to, to some people. What, it, what it, it really means, I will not give my glory to someone who's not like me. There you go. To an other. But yeah. if you are like me and the way you put it, so in union with me that you are lost and found in me, then I will give you my glory. I'll glorify you. In fact, Romans 8 says, um, and it's that. So God is dealing with our other. Yeah. Because we're yeah. not like him. Yeah. Yeah. I just just here, just um, verse 17 of chapter 42. It says this, those who trust in carved idols will turn back and be completely disappointed hmm. along with those who say to metal images, you are our gods. And, and I just have this sense. I was out again, you know, this morning, just walking, praying and, and, and praying over the, over the conference and make sure you listen to me carefully here. Cause I'm not uh, hear the, uh, hear what I'm saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Um, you'll not you'll understand why I've said that in a second. So I'm walking along thinking, Lord, it would be good to to mobilize more prayer for the conference <laughs> and, and get more people praying. So what can I do to do that? And as clear as anything, he said to me, he said, you know, nobody was praying for me when I had my ministry in the earth. And I kind of went, hmm. He says, yeah, he says, uh, nobody. And that doesn't mean we don't need people praying, because, of course, we know we, we, it, it's right that people are praying. Paul appealed for people to pray for him, and even Jesus when he was in Gethsemane. But I believe what the Lord was trying to highlight is, is your dependency upon me or is your dependency upon a method? Do you, do you live in the place that you believe it's me that's going to do the stuff? Or do you think if we can just get the right sentence out, then we'll get what we need. Yeah. And I believe that the Lord is going to challenge us and we are going to be shocked by some of the things that he calls idols that we call sacred. Wow. I believe that there's thing he, he, he was talking, it's interesting. You talk about the early church. They couldn't pick up a new Testament because it hadn't been written yet. And yet they demonstrated the New Testament by their lives. Yeah. And we've replaced a lifestyle with a book that sits on a shelf for some. And I believe the spirit of God is drawing close 
And, and you know, we're told, it, but the Apostle Paul, doesn't he, says in Romans chapter one, that the gospel is the power of God. And, and therefore, if we're truly preaching the gospel, then the power of God is present. So if the power of God's absent, the issue is not with the power of God. The issue is with the message, surely. And that's a challenge to us. And, and, he, and he began to talk to me, he said, you know, somebody doesn't get saved by saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Somebody gets saved by surrendering their life. And if that surrendering of their life happens to be expressed by praying, Jesus, come into my heart, fine. But let's not replace surrender with method. Yeah. Let's yeah. make sure that we really do have surrender. And I was reading uh, Tozer. I mean, if you don't meet with God when you're reading Toza, you maybe might not be a Christian, to be honest. But I was reading one of Toza's books and he uses this statement, which I think is poignant for our time. And he uses this term. He says, the crisis of encounter. And then he says, I'm using that word deliberately. And he doesn't really explain why he just uses the word. And I went off and I looked and, you know, a crisis, if you look at the, the dictionary definition, a crisis is a tipping point, a turning point, a flash point, uh, a moment of, 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 of impact that changes everything. And, and you know, you, I mean, you look at it, just go and look and then put it in the context of encountering God. And I've been convicted off the back of it of as leaders, are we leading people into a method or are we leading people into a crisis? Meaning a transformational moment. And, and I believe that that is always got to be our priority. It can never be our priority to get our seven point sermon off because maybe point one is the is it or whatever, but it has to be him, doesn't it? It has to be that moment of encounter. And I've been, as probably you have involved in some things over the years where I've looked and it's been, okay, now you're born again. And then I've read Wesley's journals and Finney's journals and others. And I've looked at the testimony of how people encountered Jesus. And then I've looked and this person's just gone, yes, I received Jesus as my Lord and my savior. Are we done now? Can I, can I go? And there's no real transformation of life. So I feel like I ranted a bit then, but it was yeah. an anointed rant, Jared, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need some more ranting. Pre I mean, if you're talking about Wesley, you know, and all these guys, uh, it was uh, it was spitting feathers preaching at times. Not always. Um, but uh, we need weeping preachers and ranting yeah. preachers. And uh, I mean, I, you know, uh, we, had, we had a laugh before we came on, didn't we? Talking about some of the things going on before we let everybody into the room. So it's not that we're without a sense of humour, but I, I just feel so much the seriousness of God about this moment because um, purifying is what God is doing. And I think, you know, to follow on from the phrase you just used, I thought you were going to say, I think some of us need to be born again again. Yeah. We need to, we need to, you know what, I, I did it, but I didn't do it with repentance. I just did it with belief. Yeah. And so it hasn't fully taken. I don't know if you can even use that language. I'm making it up, but you know what, why are so many Christians living a dissatisfied, powerless version of the biblical life? Yeah. They believe in the savior. They're trusting in his blood. They know he's a good, good father. All that is in place. Perhaps we're not, being raised to full life because we're not embracing full death. Come on. It's interesting you say, you know, um, it was actually while I was at Roffey, I picked up a book off of the bookshelf um, by Charles Finney. Mm. And, uh, and he was being questioned about the American awakening. And I've never forgot. I don't think I read the rest of the book. I only read this little bit. And he's asked the question. He said, then why is it that the new converts to Christ are not staying true to the faith and so many of them are falling away and Finney's response should make us all examine our hearts. And he said this, he said, the reason why the new converts are not staying true to Christ is because those who lead them to Christ only have a superficial relationship with Christ themselves. And wow. you cannot take others where you've never been. 
And that comes back again. And as leaders, as preachers, as ministers, the truth of it is, and this is the thing that challenges me, is I know that I can walk up to a pulpit with no notice and I can pull a message out and I can preach a sermon and I can do some prophecy and some people will be blessed. But I also know that when I get down, that it's not come out of a sense of leaning into the presence of God. It's come out of me relying on my past experience and ministering from a spiritual gift rather than ministering from the presence of God. And it is a terrifying thought to me that Jesus could say, many shall come to me on that day and say, we've been doing the stuff. Yeah. And I'll say, I never knew you. And it fascinates me that Jesus doesn't say you never knew me, but he says, I never knew you. And I believe that that points to something for us as leaders, that God does not want a business relationship with us. He doesn't want a dynamic that we use him to get what we want, but he wants an intimate state of communion where there is no place in our lives that we're ashamed to let him in. And actually the places of trauma, the places of disorder, the places where you feel you failed are the very places that the Holy Spirit is attracted to, according to Genesis chapter one. It says the spirit of God flutters over the chaos. And we're looking, saying, Lord, come and manifest. Look how well I've prepared this. And then Paul says, where I'm weak is where the power of God is perfected. Wow. And I believe we are going to become stronger by becoming weaker. Yeah. And come we're going on. to penetrate the world more deeply by beginning to come to the place that we allow the Holy Spirit into the places of our lives that we think, well, he doesn't want to see that because that's just embarrassing and broken and dysfunctional. And, and actually we're broken vessels in the strictest sense that Jesus wants to shine his glory out of. Yeah. And beautiful. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, if it, if it means anything, Simon, I mean, we, you've just summed up in the last 45 minutes, a lot of the spirit and word leaders summit in the last uh, two days. Um, cool. I, it, I really believe God's speaking. Wow. 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 Did you enjoy that? <sighs> Powerful. I know quite heavy stuff in some ways and, and seasons like this are difficult, but I'd rather hear the word of God than have my ears tickled right, and pretend that everything's easy and okay. We are going through a cleansing and a purifying. The purpose is so that God fills his temple with his glory and that we walk in his fullness, absolutely. Well, wow, what an evening. Been great to be with you. Um, I think I'll just leave you telling you about the tribe. If it interests you, if you want to be in on Zooms like this, if you want to get access to our learning zone and the full uncut version of this, but 700 other modules of teaching on everything from leadership, worship, the prophetic, gifts of the spirit, revival, stuff like that, uh, then come and join the tribe. Have a look at jerrocooper.net. Here's a little bit more information about that and some testimonials, what others are saying about the tribe. Been great to be with you tonight. Can't wait to be releasing our new style program. That's going to be fun. The first one is getting you to come skiing with us in the French Alps. We're going to have some fun. See you soon. God bless. What is the tribe, I hear you ask? Well, it's a global online learning community. There are loads of us around the world interacting, growing, stretching in the things of God together and having fun as we learn. There's three tiers in the tribe. Tier one is basic access to our tribe zone. It is an online learning zone. We use the same software as Harvard University. So it's great, it's powerful, it's intuitive, and it works really well on everything from a tablet to a phone to a laptop. And you can grow with us in the things of God over everything from leadership to church growth to faith, things of the spirit, prophetic, the miraculous. It's all there, 500 modules of audio, video e-courses and stuff like that. As well as that, you get a private Facebook group where you can interact with Vicky and I, and we can be growing in the things of God together. Tier two 
is all of that, but it's for leaders. It's our global leadership tribe. And so it has a lot more leadership content as well. You get four books the moment that you join sent to you, and then you will get every book I write in the period of your membership sent to you free of charge. We want to invest in leaders. And so it's much more interactive at tier two. Tier three is where 10 leaders in one team can join together so you can learn and grow. It is a brilliant resource to give to all of your team. You don't always want to lose them as they head off to Bible school. You want to train them right where they are in a training community, and that's what this is. So if tier three interests you, have a little look at that. Let me show you some testimonials of what people are saying about their life and learning with the tribe. Hey there, it's Roma Waterman here from Melbourne, Australia. I just want to say I'm amazed at the amount of resources that are in Tribe and the fresh content that's constantly being added. I say this with complete truthfulness. I think Pastor Jared Cooper is one of the best teachers in leadership and the prophetic and creativity that I have heard in the world. So I highly recommend it. I highly recommend that you sign up and, and be part of such an amazing community. Hi, my name's Dave Mullinder. I'm the pastor of Grace Church Bridlington and we can Connected with the tribe because we knew a lot of the people and the voices that we heard were encouraging and inspiring a lot of prophetic voices that helped us and guided us it helped us to feel like we were part of the global picture and not just our little part of the jigsaw but above all things we learned two specific things practical and spiritual and the practical things that we have taken principles from the tribe and applied them to our church which means we manage it better we present it better we make it look better and sound better and the practical principles have been brilliant but there is also the spiritual principles of apostolic anointing and as we've listened and applied spiritual principles into our church we've actually seen the church start to grow and we believe that we're about to hit the second wave of growth from connecting uh, to the tribe so we want to say god bless you thanks for doing what you're doing and encourage you to get involved if you can with the tribe hi i love the tribe because it's a place of the prophetic it's a place of fun and with a healthy dose of the practical included as well there's a whole wealth of resources on there that will keep you going for years and on such a range of subjects that you could do bible school in your pajamas if you wanted to and where else could you get an international apostle like Jared answering your questions? It's just brilliant. So if you ever feel a bit like Elijah and thinking, oh, poor old me, I'm the only one left who's been zealous for God, then you can just log into the tribe community and discover, no, actually, God's reserved a whole remnant of people who are, who are there, ready and waiting to encourage each other on and do great things for God's kingdom. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, come over and join us. It would be lovely to meet you. Isn't that incredible? Head to jaredcooper.net and come on, join this family of people growing in the things of God, growing in the word, growing in the spirit and enjoying this journey of walking in God together. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to make it up as you go along. Come and join the tribe and let's enjoy life together.